This is an audio recording of the Lendit Fintech Weekly News Show. The show is streamed live on Lendit TV, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter at 5 p.m. Eastern Time every Thursday. In this fast-paced show, the Lendit News team and a special guest discuss the most important fintech news stories of the past week. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Fintech Nexus Weekly News Show. My name is Peter Renton, Chairman and Co-Founder of Fintech Nexus, joined as always by my good friend and colleague, Todd Anderson. How are you doing, Todd? I'm good, Peter. Welcome back to news. Yes, great to be here. I know I've missed a couple of weeks and had to drag me off the golf course today because uh, I was uh, <laughs> out, uh, out playing golf, just got back about an hour ago. It's just wouldn't, wouldn't miss the news show. <laughs> okay, and, and joining us again for the second time, uh, Nick Milanovic. How are you doing, Nick? Doing well. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for having me. Uh, like the Broncos hat. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, we've we got another busy news uh, week to get through. So let's kick it off. Starting it off with uh, news that just came out today, um, Coinbase partnering with BlackRock. This is, uh, this is obviously great news for Coinbase, BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager. You know, they've been kind of showing that the, their interest in digital assets, they want, to bring, they want to bring some of this stuff to their investors. And Coinbase um, is going to be their uh, partner of choice here. Coinbase shares obviously jumped dramatically on the news. And it looks like it's going to focus just on Bitcoin to start off with. But still, big, uh, big shot in the arm for, for crypto, wouldn't you say? Yeah, and I think, you know, at a time when there's a lot of bad news in crypto, uh, I think last week or two weeks ago, you had Barclays invest in copper. Uh, you know, the large institutions are are actually starting to or continuing to uh, get into the space. Um, obviously, it was a huge piece of news today, and I think it's a, a nice uh, piece of news for the crypto space to see BlackRock uh, partner up with someone like Coinbase. Um, so yeah, I think the good news is, is, um, you know, something that's welcomed by the overall community (laughs) when they've been through such a, such a bad, you know, six to eight weeks. Uh, and then you get the largest asset manager to do this, this partnership. It was a a nice shot in the arm. Yeah, definitely. I think the news is very, uh, well-timed, you know, if you work on this size of deal with these size of institutions, you know that this is something that's been in discussion for at least a year, if not two. Right. So yeah. my guess is that this has been uh, a done deal, but under wraps for a while. But after battling, um, you know, insolvency rumors um, and asset withdrawals, Coinbase, I think, kind of needed a, a positive piece of news. So um, my guess is, you know, you've seen a lot of the crypto boom driven by retail activity and trading, uh, but institutions have been a little bit more conservative. Uh, my guess is this is the beginning of the uh, real interest in institutional crypto trading activity that will probably drive the next boom. Yep, yep, for sure. I think, uh, you know, we're still a long way from the next boom, but we're certainly, uh, as far as Bitcoin and ETH and most of the tokens are off their lows considerably uh, in, in the last uh, week or two. So anyway, now we'll, we'll, we'll go back to some bad news because that's kind of where we, <laughs> where we have been on the news show here for the last few weeks. But Robinhood uh, reported earnings this week that uh, they decided to um, make, they made the announcement they're cutting 23% of their staff. So that's a, that's a pretty sizable number. Um, you know, they had, a, well, they had an earnings, they, they, they brought their earnings call forward, I think, a day. And uh, the, earnings, the earnings wasn't that great either. But uh, the, big, the big news was this. Um, this this cut, you know, they they had a nine percent cut. I think it was back in April, based on you know slower slower volume, lower volumes at um, you know for both crypto and stock trading. And now, brutal. Um, they obviously overhired. The CEO said that's uh, that he made a mistake. They thought that the boom would last, and it hasn't. So, you know, you know, one in four basically Robinhood employees are no longer working for the firm. And uh, done on Slack, I believe, was the messaging. So, um, yeah, not 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 good news if you're a Robinhood employee today. Yeah, it's um, you could probably replace Vlad with you know I think uh, the Shopify CEO or, or you know whatever CEO right now says 
you know, it's my fault. Uh, I thought trends would continue and, you know, we overhired or hired too fast uh, for some of the positions that we had. Um, I think you're going to continue to see some of this pain, um, you know, in uh, FinTech for a little while now. Um, I think, you know, valuations will continue to come down. And I think, I think long term, it, it might end up being healthy for the market. Um, and maybe you'll actually see some of the, the Coinbase and um, Shopify or whoever, some of these uh, employees start stuff on their own. Uh, and so I think that's healthy, um, at least some of the employees that, that are a bit more senior that were that were let go. Um, but I, I think this pain is, is going to continue for quite some time. Um, and hopefully it turns around um, you know, early into next year. Uh, but right now it's just wait and see. Yeah, seeing Robinhood lay off 9%, and then almost a quarter of their workforce has been uh, pretty eye-opening. I think that there are some companies going through layoffs right now just because you have the opportunity to do that without taking a big PR hit because everybody's going through layoffs. But this kind of stands out in a pretty crowded field of fintech layoffs. Um, Todd, I, I think what you said is right. It was easy to hire for your trajectory when every trajectory was up into the right, but you know now you need to kind of adjust for the new trajectory and consumer purchase behavior whether it's investments, whether it's either e-com is down and nobody's really quite sure how long it's going to be down for. My hope is that they can use this time to really um, build more automation into the product. As anybody knows, when you're out of FinTech product and you're going through hyper growth, a lot of the processes that you're scaling, you're scaling manually. You're throwing more labor at the right. problem while you wait for your systems to build out. And part of Robinhood's um, you know, big value proposition is automating a lot more, automating investor statements and calls and automating a lot of the training process. So hopefully they can use this time to, to really do that um, instead of scaling in such a labor intensive way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I hope so too. It's going to be, you know, there's so many companies laying off double digit percentages of their workforce and uh, hopefully it will stop sometime soon. But I just, I want to touch on earnings for a minute because obviously we had the Robin Hood earnings. It was, you know, the earnings were bad across the board. It was, you know, I think it was 44% down year over year as far as revenue goes. Um, Shopify, also bad. But, you know, it's not wasn't bad universally. SoFi had a decent earnings report this uh, this week. And so, you know, the, the, as the as earnings season really gets gets going here, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're going to have... It's not going to be... It doesn't look like it's going to be universally bad. SoFi certainly has uh, bucked the trend. I mean, they said it's a... Good time to be a bank, and uh, I think they're I think they're right there. I mean, obviously we've got um, you know, Lending Club. Lending Club reported earnings. I think it was last week. They weren't. They, they were actually decent. Um, so far, were excellent. So, you know, it's uh, it's not all doom and gloom. I wanted to throw it out there. It's not all doom and gloom in fintech. Yeah, fintech's a big category. You have a lot of different business models. Um, you know, I think that you're going to see a divergence from lending companies to payments companies to companies that are predicated entirely on e-commerce. Um, you know, versus companies like True Accord, which are actually counter-cyclical and they help more people get um, through bad distressed debt situations. So, um, I, I think it's easy if you're like a public markets investor to treat fintech with a broad brush. Brush, but what we're going to see is that there's actually a lot of divergence. Um, and it was interesting to see SoFi. Um, you know, really have such a positive quarter relative to the rest of the industry. Yeah, I also think it goes to, you know, the the strategy that SoFi and Lending Club ultimately did with their their bank acquisition, which is a multitude of products. Uh, and the more diverse that you are, the more, um, you know, you're able to weather the storm if if one part of your business. Um, you know, drops. And I think Robinhood's feeling a bit of the pain there because, you know, they're very much focused on stock trading and crypto trading, and they've seen that drop significantly. Um, and so I think the the strategy, obviously, good time to be a bank is a funny quote, but the strategy of having that diversification uh, has allowed them to to certainly shine. I think PayPal it was in the same article that, that says after an initial hurting uh period that they've actually stabilized out pretty well as well yeah well, they're another one that really put in a positive earnings uh, earnings mm -hmm. report and uh, you know they they're you know they're extremely diversified you know probably one of the most diversified fintechs out there so anyway uh, i want to move on to regulation and we keep uh <laughs> we keep kind of steadily moving forward with uh with crypto regulation now we have 
another bill that has come, um, that, that's been introduced, and this was done in the Senate. Um, and basically, you know, we, had, we had Senator Lummis and Senator Gillenbrand uh, in June. Now we've got, uh, I don't even know how to say their names, Senator, is it Stabenow, Stabenow? Um, Senator Boozman, Senator Booker, Senator um, um, Thune, which uh, really senators, these, these are, bi- my point is that bipartisan bills. These are bipartisan bills that are being introduced. This one that was introduced this week saying the CFTC um, would have exclusive jurisdiction over digital assets that are uh, deemed commodities, which um, that's sort of still up for debate. But, um, you know, it, it just feels like there's some momentum here. I mean, we're, we're going to, I mean, then we've all called, obviously we have stable coins where we've had, uh, you know, the House Financial Services Committee has talked about stable coin regulation. Nothing's really been released yet. But it feels like we keep making positive movements forward. It didn't talk about this in the, uh, the article, but I wonder if some of it's coming to like the pressure that they're hearing from constituents. You know, cryptos, you know, went from kind of here and then it kind of leapfrogged above of fintech in terms of, you know, the the public's awareness of it. And I wonder how much can be related to like, you know, people telling their 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 congressmen, their senators, like, you know, that there needs to be some clarity here. Uh, and obviously the lobbying effort is, is huge as well. Uh, but in an election year, I'm surprised they're making even this much pro- progress. I would expect it, yeah, <laughs> I would expect it to be a bit more uh, cutthroat and, and maybe one side doing a bill and the other side trashing it. But uh, I think it's a good indication uh, that there is appetite for this. Um, and I think it's overall for the future of the industry. I think this is a nice you know step forward. There's a lot to be done, but the more that they can come together, just the better it's going to be. Yeah, I agree. I think this is very bullish for crypto that there's finally going to be a regulatory regime that is applicable to how different crypto products are treated. For the CFTC, you know, they'll probably regulate the currencies. There are crypto products that operate more like equities, and I'm sure the SEC is going to step in and they'll work on a multi-regulator strategy because every regulator wants to make sure that they have kind of a piece of the action here. But I think it's long-term positive. But try telling that to, you know, libertarian crypto diehards. Uh, you know, yes. there's a, the sovereign individual that's like the Bible for crypto libertarians. And the first thing they say is, you know, crypto is ungovernable and, you know, you can't regulate it and it's, you know, um, immutable. And, you know, try, try telling that to the U.S. government. Uh, we needed a regime for a long time. I think they've seen a lot of the high profile news stories about hacks and scams and leaks. And so this is long overdue. And yep. Bitcoin yeah, is kind of boring now by comparison. Right. Well, just imagine imagine if the, um, the, the, the Terra Luna meltdown was 20 times bigger. So it was a trillion dollar meltdown that the government would have really. Um, Those diehards would be going to the government for help. Yeah, really, really. I know, I know that. I mean, it's like, yeah, we, you've got to live in the real world. If you've got a financial product, the, fe- the federal government is going to want to regulate it. That's just uh, that's just the way it is. Anyway, let's move on away from crypto. We're going to talk about travel. <laughs> we have JP Morgan, uh, the largest bank, obviously, in this country, um, wants to be a travel agent. They've, uh, you know, they have um, made some moves in this space. They've uh, bought a, a booking system. Uh, they bought a travel agent. They obviously have their, you know, I've got Chase credit cards, points cards. And they, have, they have their own travel portal, which is actually a pretty good. It's a pretty good, yeah. um, you know, travel portal where you can go and basically book a flight or a hotel or rental car anywhere. Um, but what what was interesting is they're really, you know, I, I like Ron Shevlin's piece and maybe, um, uh, maybe he's, he's got an interesting take on it. Um, but the thing at JP Morgan, like this is a bank, you wouldn't think travel, you don't, you don't sort of think about um, travel agencies as being part of a bank, but that's, that's where we're going. And, uh, you know, I don't see, I don't see JP Morgan kind of slowing down this, this, this push. The JP Morgan super app. <laughs> uh, We're going to talk about that later. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's fascinating. I mean, I'm a, a JP Morgan customer, and, and you can do a lot from their app. Uh, and so I it's think, a good app. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's definitely one of the better, if not the best, one of the top three best uh, banking apps out there. And I think 
you know, I thought Ron's take was interesting uh, in this, using this as a, a customer acquisition channel in, in some ways. Um, you know, I think what we're finding is that financial services and other parts of the, the ecosystem are just going to continue to come together in, in various ways. Uh, and people aren't going to view their financial life, their travel, their, their work. They're going to view them eventually all together in some way. And it's just kind of how they end up using one or two or five apps. But I don't think people are going to necessarily think of these things as, as separately as we may think of them today. Uh, and so I think it's an interesting move for, for the bank overall. Yeah, I think the entire fintech VC industry is getting ahead of the uh, travel fintech merger curve by being on vacation right. in the Mediterranean right now. <laughs> <laughs> how do they book? How do they book their travel though? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That is the question. <laughs> are they using the bank web products or are they using nimble fintech competitors? All I know oh, is I'm getting auto responses every time I send an email. <laughs> yeah, no, there is, this is uh, this is the the dog days of summer, and there is a lot of. Uh, a lot of people out, but you know, the, this is said it's a, a the, the travel fintech kind of a um, niche, shall we say, is is it's heating up. Okay, um, let's move on to um, Equifax. And this was a you know, Equifax, you all we all remember the big data breach 20, I think it was like 2017 or thereabouts, where you know, 150, 175 million records were were breached. Um, this seems like this seems like a pretty rookie mistake, a pretty low level mistake. So basically for a three week period, Equifax sent out the wrong credit scores to lenders that uh, and it was usually not in the not in the borrower's favor. So someone would go along to a lender, they get their Equifax credit report and it would be different than what it, than what was reality. It was, you know, sometimes off by 20 points or more. And uh, yeah, this is a uh, Equifax, I, don't, I just honestly don't know how that, I said it was a coding issue, an update, but um, three weeks went by where people were sent, they were sent the wrong credit score. Not a good look. And, you know, I feel like, um, you know, fintech, uh, a lot of fintech companies use Equifax and, um, and that's, you know, and obviously all the banks as well. And so um, not a good look for, for lenders in general, really. I think I also I think they made a mistake too by trying to downplay this so much, as if it was like this minor glitch. Uh, yeah, I think the article, the the Wall Street Journal article, talks about one bank. It was eighteen percent of applications during that period, and that right. that's not a small number. <laughs> I mean, so I I think they also made a, a a strategic mistake not only with the with what happened but then after oh it's it's not going to impact the bottom line it's just a very minor thing um you know most people didn't see it as a um you know wasn't that different from what their normal credit score would be so they really shouldn't have gotten rates or um you know they shouldn't have been denied credit um any differently than if the mistake wasn't there and so i think it was the mistake was one thing. I think the way they handled it was even worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got to wonder at this point, after the breach, the data breach for 147 million records and uh, you know similar instances, if this is really a critical piece of financial infrastructure in the U.S., is having an oligopoly of three privately held companies you know, really the right way to manage this for people? There's so much that rides on this and, you know, we have kind of a few high profile breaches that we know about, but I'm sure that there are a lot of unaudited uh, data quality issues. I've looked at Metro 2 reports before and it is like reading Egyptian hieroglyphics without the Rosetta Stone. <laughs> it, it, I mean, I, I, I feel the pain of trying to audit that. It's like reading another language, but like at the same time, like you have to hold yourselves to a higher standard if you're providing critical infrastructure. If this was a, you know, a new fintech company, they would be out of business overnight. As oh, yeah. That happens. Yep. Yeah. No. And then, I mean, there obviously there are there are plenty, there are some fintech companies looking to address this. I know the Spring Labs guys uh, have some really interesting technology that they're building. I think you know having it, a centralized database um, for our for something as so critical as credit records. It just I feel like that's it's 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 been shown to be not a great system again and again and again. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of momentum with it. Everyone's all all the lenders, all of the even the, the fintech lenders that uh, don't use FICO scores still are hooked into 
the credit bureaus, one of them, you know, often, you know, often all three or at least one of them. So it's, it's going to take a while to change that, but it needs to, it needs to change. I yep. Think. Okay. Now we're going to talk about super apps. This was uh, Ron Shevlin's article this week that um, I'm always interested in hearing what he says. I, I don't fully agree with, with, with uh, the premise here, but basically he's saying super apps are not going to make it in America. And he goes on to define a super app pretty, you know, like it's, you know, we've, you know, Todd and I spent a lot of time in China. We've, 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 I mean, we've, I, I've had the, the WeChat app and the Alipay app on my phone. Can't really do much with it if you can't read Chinese, but uh, it's still the, you know, explaining, explain it to me where you can, you, you go into an app and you stay there for all kinds of different things. And I, I get like, we're not going to have, uh, you know, an app that does, you can, you can order flowers, you can get a, um, you can get an Uber, you can go book travel, you can do peer-to-peer payments. You can, it doesn't need to be all in one app. But I feel like the whole concept of the super app being like a huge, like a, a big umbrella with interconnected uh, services, I feel like that concept doesn't necessarily, I mean, I, I look at it as, I'd love to get you got both of your guys' perspective on this, but I think within finance, I think there's going to be a finance super app, multiple. There's not going to be one. There's going to be multiple. And I, I'm looking forward to the day because I, I look at my phone and I've got a finance folder on my phone and it's got like 20 apps in there. <laughs> yeah. And um, That's I, your I, super I, I, app. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, my folder on my phone is my super app. But, but it's, um, I feel like there's, this is just so nascent still. And you've got like, I mean, like PayPal talked about doing a super app there they're not there they're just not there yet but it feels like we should be further along than we are but um you know i'd love to get what you're with where, where, what do you guys think of the whole concept of super apps and where we are i think we need a new definition of a super app because you know i think the the definition the chinese definition of a super app i don't think is applicable outside of china right. uh, and so i think it's I think JP Morgan's, you know, on their way to to building that, which is, you know, the ability to book travel, you know, set up a um, a restaurant um, reservation, all within their app, as well as you know, trade uh, equities, take out a mortgage loan, um, you know, put money in savings. So I think it, it's it's kind of in some ways it's in the eye of the beholder of what they believe a super app will be. Um, I think we'll end up with various versions of some level of super app. I don't think it'll look like it, anywhere near what the um, the examples in China are. And I don't think people want those examples. Yeah. I think people yeah. want the interconnectivity. Um, and maybe they, they start at one place as their you know main point of contact every day. Um, but I don't think they see it as I need to do every little piece of my life in here. Yeah, I agree with that, Todd. I feel like the super app moniker gets thrown around a little too liberally. And um, I I agree with Ron on this one. Building a super app in the U.S., it feels a little bit like uh, sex in high school. You know, everybody's talking about it. (laughs) Everybody says they're doing it. Nobody's actually doing it. And nobody even really knows what it is. And so you just see, you know, earnings calls where everybody talks about their financial super app, but really it's just right. a marketplace of like a few different FinTech products. Um, I feel like if you really want a super app in the U S like one, we already have one and it's called the app store on your right. Apple phone or your Google phone. You know, Peter, the experience you mentioned that you get with like WeChat in China or grab and Gojek in Indonesia or line and Viber in Japan is phenomenal because you're staying in one product experience the whole time on your phone. You don't really need to because you have all these apps right there already as standalones. I feel like the real key is going to be breaking down the silos between travel, between restaurants, between payments, so that all of this flows uh, together nicely without having to kind of context switch and re-enter your payments information. But I haven't really seen that in the U.S. yet. Yeah, I'm looking at my my phone right now, and I've got like my regular bank. I got my fintech bank. I got my crypto. I got my peer to peer payments. I got my my savings account. I got my credit card. You know, I got my brokerage account. Uh, You know, I, I. I got my small business che- um, checking account. I got all these things that seem I'd, – I'd be happy to kind of merge some of these things together. Then, you know, then to have a little bit more – like for me to get a uh, – and my, probably my financial situation is a little bit more complex than the average person, but I, I'd i like to be able to see everything nicely. And like we live in – we have an open banking world, and yet 
these these apps there's, there's still no app that can sort of talk to like personal capital i actually think is good mint should have been good but they abandoned development of that product but uh, anyway i'm kind of digressing but i feel like there's <laughs> we still have a lot of a lot of room to before we're going to get to a not just even a super app but a fully featured financial services app i think nick hit on, on part of the important point is that you know if you can somehow do it where and set it up where you don't have to continuously log in because i mean it's annoying to like jump from one app to the other and constantly password or um yeah i mean the app, some some apps on the apple uh, phone you can do the the uh, biometric face which makes it feel more seamless if you have five apps that all do that but it it becomes a tedious exercise and i think if there's a connectivity between them then it makes it less tedious i don't know it's the way it is in china not going to happen here i think there's versions that we'll eventually get to that feel somewhat super app ish yeah, I'll take a fully featured finance app. That would be great. Anyway, moving on, I want to, the New York Fed released their quarterly report on uh, consumer credit. Really always interesting reading, lots of fun charts, if you like that sort of thing. Um, just a, couple of, a couple of highlights. Credit card balances rose 13%, which is the highest increase in two decades. And here we now have all of this effort in fintech that has gone into trying to address um, credit card balances, and uh, it just seems like they, they, they you yeah, know, they keep uh, keep going up. You know, total household debt. This includes obviously home mortgages, sixteen trillion dollars. But uh, you know, I feel like where where the consumer is back spending up big. It feels like. Yeah, and I wonder, you know, the the credit card angle. I wonder, you know, the like the motivations behind continuing to use that card. I know Peter, you're a, a point savant and you yes. use cards. Obviously you probably pay them off better than the, the normal uh, or the everyday consumer that the report probably covers. But uh, I wonder what's kind of some of the drivers behind that. Um, obviously as we hit a recession and people are making less money, they need to make ends meet. And so they go beyond their means by this, that that's a, an obvious thing, but um you know, the, the jump is just, it's so extreme. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've also seen a, you know, 10% jump in asset prices for anything with yep, the that's true. inflation rate over the last, you know, three to six months. Um, I've got a feeling that there's a lot of uh, dead brush that we haven't yet burned through. And so uh, it, it may not be the end of consumer indebtedness um, and mm-hmm. credit card charge offs maybe around the corner. Yeah, no, they they so they, there's definitely some data in there that's that, that signified that that sort of thing was coming. Okay, want to wrap up with um, so another another week and another crypto hack or two, shall we say? So there was uh, Solana, um, seven thousand seven hundred wallets were hacked, five point two million dollars stolen. Um, then we had Nomad, which is a block, which is a blockchain bridge, had $190 million stolen. It feels like every week, this is where crypto is still the Wild West. Um, there are, there's more, more and more hacks. People are searching vulnerabilities and finding them and exploiting them. And one of them was like a, I don't know what, they, what the term was they used, but it was an open hack where basically the hacker shared what he did and say, it's free for all go for <laughs> anyone wants to execute this code. You can go and steal money. This is something where I think, you know, not only crypto, but financial services firms in general need to get better at. And that's, you know, fighting the, the, uh, the fraudsters and the hackers together uh, in a more, um, you know, collaborative way. I think there there are ways that they're doing it, but I don't think they're doing it enough because a hack to Solana does not help other crypto firms. And the more that every hack is not equal, but the more it happens, the more that regulators and people in, in Congress get scared for consumers. And they bring up higher and higher bars to reach in, in regulation. So I think there needs to be better collaboration on how to solve some of this. I feel if we go a week without a crypto hack, that'll be a newsworthy story. (laughs) It's just like another day, another hack. Uh, What you can expect to see coming out of this is 
uh, a big boom in venture funded crypto security and crypto protocol auditing companies, I'm sure. Right. Yep. Right. Yeah, that's 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 a growth area um, for sure. OK, we'll have to leave it there. Um, Nick, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Todd, thanks as always. Thanks, Great to see you. Um, before we go, just a quick reminder to the audience. Next up on the FinTech Nexus calendar is Dealmakers West. This is a boutique all meetings event happening at Laguna Beach, um, just south of Los Angeles. It's going to it's at the Ritz Carlton. It's going to be fantastic. Um, We've, we've had a huge number of signups today. So if you haven't, if you're interested in that, um, fintechs, I'm talking with banks and investors. It, uh, it, I highly recommend going to fintechnexus.com to check it out. Okay, we'll be back same time next week. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thanks.